Today, I am going to tell you about someone who had one of the most incredible experiences of anyone who's ever lived. If you've ever been asked the question, if you could meet you know, anybody in all of history, who would you want to meet? And I hope if I gave you three choices that most Christians would have Jesus as one of the three. I'm just saying. You know, it's nice you want to meet Abraham Lincoln and all, but you know, I'm assuming if I gave you three choices, Jesus would be one of them. Can you imagine being able to see Jesus face to face, to hear him speak, to hear the sound of his voice, and assume that you could understand Aramaic or Hebrew, but to hear his voice, to look into his eyes, well, imagine being the one person who actually got to do those things at the most difficult moment in Jesus' life, when he was walking the last painful steps to Calvary with his cross. That man's name was Simon. And he was from Cyrene, the main city in the Roman colony of Libya, in North Africa. And the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all state that Simon of Cyrene carried the cross for Jesus when he was simply too weak to bear it any further. And each of the three Gospels contributes a piece of important information. So listen to these three scriptures in turn. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Many of us have probably had the experience of looking forward to a significant trip to a special place. I hope you can think of one. We have about 20 people in our church who are looking forward to a trip to Kodiak, Alaska this July to go to Kodiak Baptist Mission and to work there. We've got another group that'll be end up 43 of us going to Italy in November on a pilgrimage. And I know all of us who go on that group, we're going to look forward to it. But whatever trip you may have been on in your life, you know what you do ahead of time. You save your money. You make your plans. You look forward for months and months anticipating what it will be like, what you will see, where you will go, what you will do. Now, Jerusalem has been a place to which pilgrimage, pilgrims have made journeys for thousands of years. At the time of Jesus, Jews traveled from near and far to come to the holy city for festivals and for special days, especially for Passover. Even today, all these years later, our Jewish sisters and brothers, when they celebrate Passover, wherever they are, that's not Jerusalem will say, next year, in Jerusalem. Well, Simon of Cyrene was making just such a special trip, just such a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but he was doing it in the days before planes, trains, and automobiles. And even as good as Roman roads were, even as fast as the ships were then, it took a lot of time and a lot of money to make a journey like that from North Africa to the Middle East. Now, any of us who have who has saved, planned for, prepared for, and look forward to a special trip, we can relate to the feelings that Simon has. He likely arrived within a few days of Passover. Let's say for the sake of argument, he even arrived what we now call Palm Sunday. But he likely arrived within the last few days filled with excitement and anticipation and joy. He's going to be in the holy city of Jerusalem for Passover, the festival of celebrating the deliverance of the people of God from slavery in Egypt. 
And Mark and Luke both mention that Simon on Good Friday was coming into Jerusalem from the country, meaning his accommodations were outside the city walls by some distance because Jerusalem was just overwhelmed. Think Cape Cod in the summer times some factor. You know, if that was Jerusalem for Passover. And dressed in his finest clothes, can you see him in your mind's eye? Here comes Simon, heading towards the, great, the gates of Jerusalem and the temple with quick and determined steps that Friday morning and having pictured this day in his mind over and over, he is totally unprepared for what happens next. We could probably have uh, actually fun sitting around sometime telling trip horror stories of things that went wrong, luggage that was lost, flights that were canceled, those sorts of things. Nothing that has gone wrong on a trip for you can compare to what happened to Simon. Because as he enters Jerusalem, a motley crowd is coming toward him. And you can feel the tension and the fear in the air. And among the crowd, you can see there are men and there are women. There are religious leaders and Roman soldiers. There's common everyday folks and some people look angry. The faces of other people are contorted by despair and pale. And some of the women are wailing. And at the center of it all, there's Roman soldiers and the condemned criminal himself coming right towards Simon. And the soldiers want Jesus to go faster, but he's been beaten, he's been whipped, he's been bleeding for a while. There's a trail of blood behind him marking his path, and he's nearing the end of his strength, and he halts and he's swaying under the weight of the heavy beam and the crossbar that will be nailed to it to form the cross, and he simply can't go any further under this burden, and he collapses to the street. And the impatient soldiers who want to get this awful job over with as quickly as possible look around to grab someone to help the prisoner. And their eyes fall on someone who wasn't even part of that crowd in Jerusalem, but someone who was on his way into Jerusalem to go and worship, who had simply paused for a moment to see what was going on. And Simon's long-anticipated dream trip of a lifetime suddenly turned into a nightmare, worse than he could ever have imagined. Put yourself in his place. Your mind focused on worship and devotion and the great celebration of Passover, and all of a sudden, the strong, heavy hand of a Roman centurion clasp your shoulder and with authority commands you to pick up a heavy, blood-stained piece of wood. And of course, you're unwilling. You're repulsed. You seek to flee. Matthew and Mark both say that Simon had to be compelled, meaning he resisted, perhaps even struggled to get away. And one translation of Luke says they laid hold of him. You know, they seized him. He's forced to submit, and you don't have to raise your hand on this, but you know one of the most common fears that people have is public speaking? You know that, right? You've heard that before? It's shocking to me, but everyone's different. <laughs> but, but if you don't like public speaking, if the idea of getting up in front of a crowd of people and speaking scares you, can you imagine being in Simon Sandals? He is in front of a mob of people, all kinds of emotions and stuff going on, and you have to pick up this thing and walk behind Jesus in the midst of a mob following the bloody footprints. And I imagine Simon thinking of his wife and his sons, and how will he ever tell them of this awful turn of events. I mean, suddenly getting stuck in traffic or having your flight canceled or losing your luggage doesn't seem so bad, does it, in comparison to this? But then something happens, Luke tells us, that completely changes Simon's feelings. 
The wailing of the women's voices continues and it even rises as they near the hill and slowly Jesus stops and he turns and he looks at the women and he says, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the womb that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? And it wasn't just the warning Jesus gave about the fate that awaited others if this was the fate of the innocent. It was the concern with which he spoke at a moment like that for others. The compassion in his eyes, the unbelievable inner strength he displayed. And when he looked at Simon and their eyes met, Simon felt something inside him that he could not describe. But I think he carried the cross with very different feelings after Jesus said those words. And we're going to hit the pause button there. And we're going to fast forward seven weeks. Simon's time at Jerusalem, I imagine, is drawing to a close. And soon he's going to begin that long journey home. But there's one more celebration to be a part of in Jerusalem, and that's the celebration of Pentecost, which comes 50 days after Passover. And since the experience of carrying the cross, Simon has learned a great deal about the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. And the more he has learned, the more he has wanted to hear about their teaching, about his teaching, about his parables, about his healings, about his miracles. And for weeks, stories have circulated that his body disappeared in the days after his execution. And while some scoffed that his disciples had stolen the body, no one seemed able to answer how they could have done so when the tomb was under guard and sealed with a large stone. Well, on the day of Pentecost, maybe for the last time, Simon comes to Jerusalem around 9 o'clock in the morning, the time for the morning sacrifice in the temple. And once again, he runs into a crowd in Jerusalem, and this time the crowd is very different than the crowd he experienced on Good Friday. There is excitement. There's a lot of talking in many different languages. Fellow Jews from numerous countries clad in colorful outfits that reflect their homelands. And Acts chapter 2 and verses 9 through 11 tells us the crowd included those from the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. So we know folks like Simon were present. And at the front of the crowd, there were some young men speaking in a way that was capturing people's attention. And some folks were asking what it all means and what was going on. And one man stepped forward, and Simon later learned that his name was Peter. And Peter delivered a powerful message of God's deliverance for all people from their slavery to sin through Jesus who died on the cross that all people might be forgiven. Have you ever had a moment in your life where someone said something to you and it was like the biggest aha light bulb going off moment ever? This is a Hollywood searchlight moment for Simon. Can you conceive of the change that occurred in Simon at that moment? This crucified Messiah, this chosen one of God, this Jesus who had been raised from the dead after dying for the sins of the world, Simon himself had carried his cross. Can you see his jaw hitting the top of his foot? If he had only known at the time what God was up to and who Jesus was, I suspect there would have been less reluctance to carry his cross. He never would have, you know, he wouldn't have hesitated. He probably would have considered it an honor for which he was not worthy. A privilege beyond calculation. Carrying the cross 
what Simon thought was the worst possible moment of his life, crushing his hopes and his dreams, changing his long-made plans, would in fact turn out to be the most remarkable experience of his life. Sometimes, out of our most difficult trials, our hardest ordeals, our deepest disappointments, marriages or relationships that have failed, the death of loved ones who are precious to us, jobs that don't work out, our own declining health, futures that are yet unknown, our struggle to overcome our own temptations, weakness, or addictions. Even out of these experiences can come life-altering insight and perspective. I mean, if God can bring something good out of the horror of, ca of carrying a condemned man's cross, God can bring something redemptive out of almost any experience that we have to go through in life. If, like Simon and those first 3,000 souls who gave themselves to Christ on that first Pentecost Sunday, if we're willing to dedicate ourselves to a personal relationship with Jesus, if we're willing to let him be our guide and our leader in our life, God can bring good even out of an awful experience. I believe that Simon was one of those 3,000 souls who heard and believed and had the joy of being forgiven and the power of the Holy Spirit strengthening him to live a new life. I want to describe for you one more scene this morning. Can you imagine Simon back home? Back home in Cyrene and Libya and North Africa. His long-planned and memorable trip to Jerusalem over. It's been the experience of a lifetime. And he returns a totally changed man. I mean, what a story he has to tell his family and his friends. No pilgrim in history, I don't think, has had a greater experience, a more amazing story to tell. And his wife and his children can listen to him tell it over and over again, and they never tire of hearing it. They shudder as he tells of being forced by the soldiers to carry the cross up to the hill where the execution takes place. He describes for them the prisoner, his words, his bearing, and everything that he could remember and that happened. And his family sits amazed as Simon relates what occurred on Pentecost and how he became a follower of the way of Jesus. And in the process, he leads his wife and his sons also to become followers of Jesus as well. Now we know this, and I'm going to ask you to stay with me now because how many of you like, I, I don't, I confess, I don't watch them, but there's about a million TV shows that are CSI this and CSI that, and it's all about figuring stuff out and how do they know this? Well, I don't do that with TV shows, but I do enjoy doing it with the Bible. So stay with me now, because we're going to do some Bible detective work that helps us see how we know certain things. It's crime scene investigation is what CSI stands for. Someone was asking. Okay, so stay with me now. We know that Simon's family became believers because Mark 15, 21 tells us that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, the fact that Mark is the only gospel that indicates you know, their names, the only ones who mentions Alexander and Rufus, without any need to explain who they are, indicates they were well-known persons for those for whom Mark was writing. It's a way of like saying, if I was writing a letter to you, oh, well, you know, he was the father of, you know, people we all know. The sons, by the time Mark's gospel was written, some 25 to 30 years after what happened with Simon, by the time that was written, the sons were, were better known to the early church for whom Mark was writing than their father. And that's why Mark explains the family connection. This was the dad of Alexander and Rufus, who you all know. Now, in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, 
It describes Mark, the writer of the gospel, who I'm talking about. Acts 12, 12 describes Mark's mother's home in Jerusalem, which was large enough so that a good number of people could gather there to pray. And it also mentions that she has a Greek servant, which means they're people of some means. And we know that Mark tra traveled with Paul and Barnabas, then with Barnabas, and later with Paul again. And eventually, Mark comes to Rome with Paul. And the last reference to Mark in the New Testament is 2 Timothy 4.11, which is a request from Paul that Mark should meet him at Rome. Mark, we know, was a Roman citizen as well, likely settled in Rome, and it's likely that Mark wrote his gospel in Rome for people who knew Simon of Cyrene's sons, Alexander and Rufus. We know this also from Paul's letter to the Romans, because in the 16th chapter of Romans, where Paul greets all these people, we read Paul's personal greeting, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, a mother also to me. There's no other Rufus mentioned in the New Testament except in these two places. Okay? It's the same guy. And it looks like the Apostle Paul was a guest in the home of Rufus' mother, which is the wife of Simon of Cyrene, and that she cared for him in some way, somewhere during his missionary journeys. Now apparently, again, remember, this is 25 to 30 years have passed. Simon has likely died during the intervening years, and according to tradition, Alexander, Rufus' brother, had suffered martyrdom as a Christian missionary by the time Paul wrote Romans. You with me? And even if you're not, just nod, because I don't want to have to go over it again. <laughs> it's pretty amazing to think that out of what Simon of Cyrene must have clearly thought was the worst experience of his life, carrying the cross, actually began a whole new phase and chapter in his life. It began a deeper, truer life of faith, a more honest appraisal of himself and the cost of his own sin. How could you ever take the cost of sin lightly when you literally carried the cross behind a bleeding Jesus? Do you think he ever took sin lightly again in his life after that? I don't think so. It started a personal relationship with Jesus and a dependence on the Holy Spirit in his daily life. And out of what was the worst moment in his life, came eventually the greatest meaning and a whole new destiny as he and his family, his wife and his sons, were greatly used by God in the first critical years of the growth of the Christian movement. And it all began with carrying a cross. Now we know from archaeology... <laughs> I can't believe people think the Bible's boring. You know, it's just so cool. We know from archaeology that the gospel got to Cyrene very early because there are first century Christian, Christian burials in the Jewish cemetery in Cyrene. And we know from Acts chapter 13 that men from Cyrene, including Simon the Black, he's a black African, Simon the Black and Lucius are leaders in the church at Antioch. And again, it all began with carrying a cross. I close with these words. Like Simon, we too can learn to carry our cross. And for some of us, it is heavy, it is burdensome, it is backbreaking. We get up on a day and say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make it, right? But we can say as Paul did, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Like Simon, we can learn to carry our cross. Like Simon, we can pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And just as Simon shared his faith with his family and his friends, we can share what God has done for us in our family and with our friends and those close to us. When you look at the cross, 
And I know many of you wear a cross, and many of you have crosses displayed in your homes. When you look at the cross, of course it should remind you of God's love and forgiveness. It should remind you of Jesus' sacrifice for you. But perhaps think every now and then about Simon of Cyrene, who carried it, and how history changed, because he did. Let's pray. Jesus, grant us strength to carry the cross. On those days when life seems too demanding, with all its cares, burdens, and concerns, grant us strength to carry the cross. When we experience great loneliness deep inside and the pain of separation fills our spirits, Jesus, grant us strength to carry the cross. When we feel the pain of our world and unite in compassion with the earth's suffering people, grant us strength to carry the cross. When we struggle with decision making and the time comes to make good choices about our lives, grant us strength to carry the cross. When we are with others in their physical pain or when we vigil with one we love who has a terminal illness, Jesus, grant us strength to carry the cross. When we're asked to go the extra mile, to be generous with our time and your presence, when we feel weary and worn out, when it seems like all of our energy has been drained away, when we're challenged to risk our security and accept new growth in our relationship with you, when we experience the effects of aging or extended illness on our bodies or our minds, Jesus, grant us strength to carry our cross. When we feel discouraged, desolate, and depressed, and want to withdraw from others, when worries and concerns choke our peacefulness and leave us with anxiety and fear, when we harbor old wounds and are called to offer or to receive forgiveness, Jesus, grant us strength to carry the cross. Together, crucify Jesus. Help us to take up our cross day by day, through these crosses, we can grow closer to you. Help us to lean on you and to learn from you. May we not give in to self-pity or self-doubt. Rather, let us trust in your presence, which strengthens us. Encourage us on our tomb-like days and remind us of your resurrection. Help us to keep our vision focused on life and growth in your kingdom, now and forever. Amen.